Welcome to Superhero Pow. I'm your host nerd, Tom Frumgen. Hey, who feels like making a list? I don't know about you, but it's one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah, something must be wrong with me. But let's make a list. A top 10 list of the best stuff DC Comics published in the 1990s. The 1990s was an interesting time for DC. It started with the afterglow of the 1980s, when DC reinvented itself and comic books in general, with the likes of Crisis on Infinite Earths, Batman the Dark Knight, and Watchmen, not to mention giving birth to a more mature line of comics with Vertigo. But too quickly it devolved into stunt mania, as they killed Superman, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and replaced Batman and Wonder Woman. Plus the crazy crossovers, like Zero Hour, The Bungled Armageddon 2001, Eclipse of the Darkness Within, Genesis, and others. Still, despite all that schlock, DC still put out some amazing work. I'm talking James Robinson's Golden Age and Starman, Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's Superman for All Seasons, the kickoff of Young Justice, Mark Wade's JLA Year One, not to mention his Impulse series, Warren Ellis and Derek Robertson's Transmetropolitan, Ron Mars and Daryl Banks' Green Lantern Run, Batman Black and White, Alan Davis' The Nail, Jerry Ordway's The Power of Shazam, Garth Ennis and John McRae's Hitman, Peter David's Hook Horror Aquaman, The Chart-Topping Catwoman by Jim Ballant, John Ostrander's The Spectre, the late Mike Pobrick's work on The Batman Adventures, Dave Gibson and Steve Rude's World Finest, Alan Grant and Norm Brayfogle's Detective and then Batman comic run, Hellblazer, and, least we forget, the Milestone collaboration. But let's cut to the chase of the most beloved, iconic, and successful things DC put out in the 1990s. Starting with number 10, Preacher, a Vertigo series by Garth Innes and Steve Dillon. Basically, the final culmination of the British invasion and irreverent comic book storytelling that started with Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run back in the 80s. Preacher gave us comic-defining moments with Hair Star, The Saint of Killers, and the showdown with God himself. And saying the title character, Jesse Custard, operated in the mystical underbelly of the DCU, would be an understatement. There was nearly no deprived act or motivation that wasn't on display in its 66-issue run, though all made palatable by Innes' dark wit and Dylan's brilliant art. Still, when Jesse Custer's metaphysical adventures came to an end, mainstream comics had no more taboos left to break. Number 9. The Flash by Mark Wade. While Mike Barron and William Messner Loeb's gave birth to the adventures of Wally West Flash, Mark Wade made it one for the ages, blending great superhero action with great character drama. Wade had nearly every Flash fan eating out of his hands as he balanced Flash lore with ever-evolving storylines, even creating the concept of the Speed Force. He was joined by fellow writer Brian Michael Augustine and various artists like Paul C. Ryan and Greg LaRock, with whom he created the epic Return of Barry Allen story. But easily the best remembered is the late Mike Warengo, who helped cement Wade's run on The Flash as one of the best the character ever saw. Number 8. Superman, Peace on Earth by Paul Denny and Alex Ross. And let's be honest, we're talking the other big books as well. Batman War on Crime and the 2000s Shazam, Power of Hope and Wonder Woman, Spirit of Truth. Alex Ross was a classically trained painter who had hit it big in the 90s with Marvels for Marvel Comics. His Norman Rockwell-like illustrations were something the superhero genre had never seen before. For once, it actually looked like these characters were real people. Teaming up with Paul Dini, an animation writer launched into fame due to his episodes in Batman the Animated Series, Together, they created one-shot tales meant to highlight the unique characteristics of DC's most iconic heroes. As Alex put it, it wasn't meant to be just another fight. The heroes had to deal with real-world issues that they couldn't just punch, which would then showcase who they are and their motivations, giving readers a more grounded take on these fantastic heroes. The oversized format also helped showcase Alex's amazing paintings. So while clearly a vanity project for Alex, with Paul helping it come true, it's a vanity project all DC Hero fans have and can appreciate. 
Number 7. The Legion of Superheroes and Legionnaires After the crisis on Infinite Earths, DC more or less rebooted and retooled all their heroes to great success. Except for the Legion of Superheroes. The bright and sunny teenagers of the future were twisted into grim and gritty Blade Runner-esque adults. But by issue number 24, DC started to hedge their bets by creating teenage clones of the Legion. And by issue number 41, the clones took over, and they were given their own title, Legionnaires, kicked off by the Legion writers Tom and Mary Bierbaum, with fan-favorite artist Chris Sprouse, who really helped sell this new and exciting era of the Legion. Then, after the Zero Hour, the original Legion was erased from history, and the clones were now the Legion of Superheroes, with Tom Pyre and Roger Stern taking over the writing for both books. The Legion of Superheroes went through a bunch of different artists, but over in the Legionnaires, fan-fave Jeff Moy was there to stay. The series was marked by the creation of heroes like XS, Gates, and Monstrous, plus the epic Mordu story. The bright and shiny future was returned, lovable teenage drama took center stage, and great superhero action wrapped it all up. Unfortunately, as the 90s came to a close, DC switched back to the grim future storylines, and both Legion books were quickly canceled and have been struggling ever since, which has probably helped the love of this run remain so strong. Number 6. Batman Mad Love The biggest thing to hit Batman in the 90s was Batman the Animated Series. It broke the mold for American television animation and helped give fame to American animation creators, mostly being artist-producer Bruce Timm and writer Paul Dini. While DC couldn't get them to work on the comic book adaption of the show, except for a few times, they did manage to get them to work on an origin tale for their growing superstar, Harley Quinn. Bruce and Paul put together 64 pages highlighting Harley Quinn's ill-fated romance with the Joker, from how it came about to how one-sided it is. Not to mention how Batman plays too much like a third wheel in their relationship, at least in Harley's opinion. Swinging for the fences, they figured to make a story with so much violence and sex that it could never be animated for so-called children's television. Until it was. That just shows you how powerful and great this story is. Batman Mad Love is sad, hilarious, and perfect. A must-read Batman book. Number 5. Green Lantern, Emerald Dawn, and Emerald Dawn 2 Okay, it started in 1989, but the bulk of these two six-issue miniseries were published in the 90s, and it was basically DC's crisis reboot of Green Lantern. And like Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman before him, it was a great modernization of the character, blending the classic tale with modern sensibilities and characterizations. Although, apparently it was such a tough job, after getting the final issue approved, writer Christopher Priest quit. Keith Giffen, with Gerald Jones scripting, would write the remaining 11 issues, while artist Mark Bright would draw all 12 issues. But now, Hal Jordan had become a flawed character who never fully processed witnessing the death of his father at a very young age, who was also a test pilot. He became a young man with nothing to live for, until he received the ring. The storyline also added fan fave Kilwog as his Green Lantern trainer, and still a Green Lantern Sinestro as his mentor. And it is easily the best Green Lantern origin story ever. Yeah, you heard me. Unfortunately, as great as the Emerald Dawns were, the follow-up Green Lantern series did not follow suit as the younger and more engaging Hal Jordan was replaced with the typical dull, now middle-aged Hal Jordan. So much so that at the end of 1993, they turned him into a villain in Emerald Twilight and replaced him with Kyle Rayner. Years later, writer Jeff Johns would revive Hal and revamp the whole Green Lantern concept with rainbow colors and emotional entities. But either way, Green Lantern Emerald Dawn stands as the best attempt to give Hal Jordan a real personality. Number 4. Batman Halloweens It started back in 1993, 
with Batman Legends of the Dark Knight Halloween Special Number 1 by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale, followed by Batman Madness in 1994, Batman Ghosts in 1995, and then the 13-issue miniseries Batman the Long Halloween in 1997. Loeb and Sale's pairing on Batman was so popular it even carried over to the 2000s with Batman Dark Victory. The duo would then move over to Marvel for their color series. But fueled mostly by Tim's macabre art of Batman's world, seeing his take on each villain was a real treat, the Halloween series really struck a chord with Batman readers, as they were for the most part flashback stories of Batman happening only a few years after the events of Frank Miller's iconic Batman Year One. And while the parade of villains was the sight to see, Loeb dug deep into the organized crime world of Gotham as well, how it ate itself under the pressure of Batman and the never-ending parade of costume villains. While the regular Batman books were good enough at the time, the Halloween books were really what Batman fans wanted to read, more tales based in the world Frank Miller had created, blend it with the splashing adventures Batman was always known for. It's pretty funny to think that this iconic pairing and these iconic stories all started with a simple holiday one-shot. Number 3, Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Okay, again, this started in 1989, but it ran all the way until 1996, which is why I included on the 90s list and not the 80s list. Okay? Now, to a degree... What can one say about Neil Gaiman's Sandman? Following in the footsteps of comic book legend Will Eisner, Gaiman, with a host of different artists, took comics away from superheroes and towards overall fiction itself. It told and built a supernatural mythology for the DCU based on eternal beings known as the Endless. Death, destiny, destruction, desire, delirium, despair, and the title character, Dream, the Sandman. Basically, the guardians and overseers of reality itself. It wasn't so much about good versus evil as it was about being itself. It played right into the 90s zeitgeist of supernatural, metaphysical, and artistic temperament. With editor Karen Berger, it helped birth the Vertigo imprint in 1993, which would point the way to how comic books would be written and published in the future. Now I would be remiss if I didn't mention the very modern, for the time, multimedia cover paintings by David McKeon, the only artist to stay with Neil on the entire 75-issue run. Gaiman himself had stated he was stunned when DC accepted his pitch for Sandman, and later may have regretted it, as the depth and complexity of the story took a massive toll on him. But anyway you slice it, Sandman changed comic books forever. Number 2. JLA by Grant Morrison and Howard Porter After writers Keith Giffen and J.M. DeMattez left the Justice League in 1992, the shine of it being a humorous book quickly wore off. That plus DC's rule of only allowing one iconic hero on the team at a time left the book in a slow decline. Only the force of the growing superstar Grant Morrison's desire to write the book with all the iconic heroes those that were still alive, mind you, could save it. And save it he did, with big bombastic stories and bold graphic storytelling by artist Howard Porter. DC's Magnificent Seven were back, with new twists on old Justice League villains and Batman taking the role as the team's master strategist, to some fans' cringe. The JLA marked a bold return and plotted the future of all Justice League stories to come. About the only real criticism you could throw at the book was that the fantastic and bold concepts came so fast and so furious in those mere 40 issues, you hardly had time to appreciate one great moment because another was just pages away. And to throw a 2000 cherry on top, when Grant finally left, writer Mark Wade took over and penned one of the best Justice League stories ever. The Tower of Babel when villains used Batman's own contingency plans against his fellow teammates, against them. JLA is easily one of the best runs the Justice League has ever had. Number 1, Kingdom Come by Mark Wade and Alex Ross. After wowing the comic book world with Marvels, over at Marvel, painter Alex Ross moved over to DC, 
teaming up with writer Mark Wade, he basically managed to do to the entire DCU what Frank Miller did to Batman in The Dark Knight, a near-future tale of the next generation of super beings foregoing the titles of hero and villain to just run amok, forcing the old and retired DC heroes back out of retirement and into a war over superhero ideology, with the fate of the world hanging in the balance. Like Watchmen and Batman the Dark Knight before it, the existence of superheroes had grim and fatal consequences. Kingdom Come also featured nearly every DC hero, in some form or another, and it was all mind-blowingly painted in realism that comic books had never seen before. And although it was a possible future tale, the weight of its popularity would change the way DC viewed their most iconic heroes from there out. Kingdom Come is one of those comics that were just lucky was made. Now I know many like to consider the 1990s the dark age of comics, as the grim and gritty of the 80s was kicked up with the extremeness of the new decade. I actually find it a little more sad than that, though. As I mentioned earlier, it started by carrying over the greatness of the 80s, and then it devolved into gimmick concepts that the industry as a whole would just recycle over and over again, trying to prop up short-term sales to an aging readership at the expense of long-term sales to new readers. Still, in a good way, it was moving the needle away from superheroes and even Marvel and DC's dominance in the industry. The marketplace was becoming a richer environment, even though superheroes were once again becoming stuck in place. I suppose I shouldn't walk away from the 1990s without mentioning the DC-Marvel crossovers, although the bulk of them were barely worth reading. Still, we got to see Batman vs. Captain America, Spider-Man, The Punisher, and Daredevil. He was the busy one. Meanwhile, Superman fought the Hulk, the Fantastic Four, and the Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer also hung out with Green Lantern. Darkseid fought Galactus, and of course there was DC vs. Marvel itself, and its shockingly pathetic follow-up series, All Access. But okay, enough of that. We were talking about the good things that came out in the 1990s. So what did you think of our picks? Did we miss something? Well, be sure to let me know as you like, subscribe, and comment. Right now, I'm going to listen to some Jagged Little Pill, feed my Tomagachi, and eat a Lunchable. <laughs> 